Now, every year at ARIS, we take a look at the macroeconomic situation in the Region 1. This year, we're delighted to welcome on the ARIS stage the Asia Analyst of the Economist Intelligence Unit, Shetarn Hansakul. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Property Guru team for inviting me to be here and to represent um, the Economist Intelligence Unit. My job today is to tell you um, about what lies ahead for the world economy, all, all the questions that are burning in your mind. Uh, when will the war in Ukraine end? Where are interest rates heading? Um, we don't have a crystal ball, but we put our heads together and um, I will just go through what we forecast and what are our prediction. Okay, what next for the world economy? First question we must address is the war in Ukraine. Where is it headed? Has sanction worked? Well, sanction has worked. It has really pushed the Russian economy into recession, but it's not working to end the war. What we have seen this year and what we expect to happen next year is even further escalation of of the need to pressure the other side. So the more sanction the US and the Western allies impose on Russia, they react by acting more aggressively. So we, we are not very hopeful that um, this conflict will end by coercion. Now there have been some um, hints of both sides being open to talk, but it's not um, very clear. So the prospect is still quite, quite remote. So what else can the West do that will pressure Russia further? They can try to um, impose um, a more strict ban on oil Im import from Russia. They already um, impose a price cap on Russia oil imports. They can try to expand the sanctions to include those that are doing business with Russia. And many other things that will actually potentially escalate the conflict. So we are mindful that this security risk is going to be present in next year. So are we heading toward a global recession? Well, 2022 is almost ending and we don't you know, it's quite obvious we are not in a global recession. But we are wary that for a few um, Western European economies, um, they will see a technical recession, which means that they will have a quarter to quarter um, negative growth, two quarters in a row, um, in the fourth quarter of this year, this quarter, and into the next quarter, in the first quarter of 2023. And these countries are uh, the UK, France, Germany, and Italy, they're, they're, they're big economies, so it's quite worrying. The risks are even more stacked in 2023. This year, in 2022, our forecast or estimate for global growth is 2.9%, and this is down from 3.9% at the beginning of the year, which means that one trillion US dollars have evaporated because of the war and other things, not only the war, what happened in China too. So in 2023, we are hopeful or we think that the, the world as a whole will not be in recession. It will grow, but it will grow at a much slower pace of 1.5%. And a few regions will actually see, um, a few countries will actually see an outright recession. So there, there are risk. Um, around, um, but not, not for everyone. The, the commodities producers are actually uh, having a good year this year, and uh, next year will not be too bad for them, but not as good as this year. But what we see is that the environment that used to be so uh, conducive to global growth before 2018 is now gone. You, you, you know, the low interest rates, low inflation, and the more cooperative um, um, spirit among countries are not going to be around. So this is what we see in 2023.
global growth only 1.5%, and we have um, a color map. So those in purple and blue are not good news. Purple is actually in the recession territory. Um, but luckily in Asia, we, we are mostly in, in green, and then there are some in um, orange and red, which means that we are still growing. So in, in Asia, the fastest growing economy will be Vietnam, still above 6%. But the rest will be growing um, between 2 to 4, mostly. But unfortunately, um, the recession will, will happen in Europe. We are calling for a shallow recession, about um, negative 0.3%. And the US will barely grow. 0.1%, um, and you know the risk of recession is is high. So this is comparing 2022, 23, and 24. So you can see that Asia Pacific actually is not doing too badly. It's it's recovering um, on cue from from the COVID pandemic, and um, it's going to grow. Um, into 2024, so we have even, despite the bad year in 2023, we are, we are going to see a better 2024, so that's what we can hope for. And another uh, region in the world that will be doing um, well is the sub-Saharan um, Africa. The rest of uh, the, the regions are not going to see such even growth. Um, some are seeing um, quite a weak 2023 and a slight rebound in 2024. So um, Asia and Africa will be more of the growth, uh, faster growing regions in the next two years. Okay, next question everyone must be asking, what, what will happen to energy prices? Oh, the good news first, the good news is energy prices will come down next year. But the bad news is it will not come down to the level that we saw um, before uh, the war in Ukraine. So it will, it will stay high. This year, we uh, estimate that uh, oil price will average um, just above $100 um, dollars per barrel. Um, next year, we'll come down to about just below 90 And then in 2024, um, also further down. But it's still um, significantly higher than before. And the same for the same pattern for natural gas. What about commodities? Same story. Um, this is for both um, the um, the hard commodities and soft commodities, unfortunately. And for those of you in construction, um, for the hard commodities, we we see higher upside risk for copper and aluminium. And in the soft commodities, we, we see a significantly um, decline for, for a, few, a few key ones. But again, you know, it's still high for, uh, compared to the pre-war period. So that's, that's bad news for food security for the developing economies in the world. Okay, next, next big question, U.S. interest rates. How, how high it will go, and then how, how, how long will it stay high. So we actually see the peak um, coming around the first quarter of next year. So we will see the Fed hike again in December coming up, and then more in the first quarter of next year, and then they will pause. And in 2024, um, it could come down uh, slightly. In the other key central banks, the ECB and the Bank of England will um, continue to hike a little bit longer than the US, but then again, it, um, all, all of them will peak and start coming down in 2024. So that's where we see the global interest rates going. As for Asia, um, we've seen the US Fed setting the pace for Asian central banks. But uh, most of the central banks in Asia don't match the pace uh, of interest rate increase in the Fed. So we see that in Asia next year, interest rates will peak as well. But it may stay a little bit longer. Um, uh, the, the, the tightening or the rate increase may uh, prolong a little bit more than the U.S. to narrow the gap of interest rate differential. So 
um, this is the World Outlook last slide. So how has the coronavirus pandemic and the war in Ukraine changed the world? Uh, there are a few areas that that happens. Number one, now defense spending is back again, and um, it's very unfortunate. It's, it's the money that I wish we could give to UN Habitat to build more houses for everyone, but no, you know, countries are actually allocating more money to build weapons. Um, next, finance will get more complicated, a weaponization of finance. So we will see more efforts of trying to cut off countries like Russia from the global network. And this will not deter Russia, as you know. Um, you know. To a certain extent, China is bearing the brunt of this too. But what this means is that they will um, employ technology in order to circumvent this. So we will see digital currencies, and they will, they will um, develop their own um, ecosystem that connect with, with the rest. Um, of course, ESG and sustainability, you know, we've seen debates and, and um, controversies surrounding that, but our view is that sustainability is here to stay, and ESG will, will become increasingly important for the world. It's a, it's a mega trend. Um, but of course, the rules and the, uh, the standards will, will need to be synchronized and um, you know, work, workable for everyone, rather than to, to, to have greenwashing and that sort of thing. So there may be a little bit of divergence also for the developed economies which, which have more money and are more ready to adopt renewables. But in the developing world, the um, renewable push is actually being deterred by the high energy prices now. So that might be delayed, but it will come back. Even a country like Thailand, during the hosting of APEC um, uh, last month, they have um, unveiled their economic model of um, uh, bio, green, um, bio uh, circular and green BCG. Um, then they're gonna embed into the economic development in the future. Then technology, uh, not to be outdone by finance, um, you know, the tech bifurcation risk is a real and present danger for everyone. Um, we have the, you know, the chip wars, uh, U.S. effort to reshore um, semiconductor production back to the U.S. That we see will stay with us at least um, for in the foreseeable future. We see um, the Chip 4 Alliance of the U.S. trying to get the Asian economies of um, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea to try to build a democratic alliance for chip makers. Um, we are not very hopeful how that will go, but um, what it is is that it's just going to create a little bit of friction and, and, and the countries involved are also at a national level, the governments want to ally with the U.S., but at the, national, at the company level, the countries are also in a bind because they, they, China is a big market. So it's, it's a difficult situation. Then, uh, last but not least, I touch upon this. Commodities is now back on the mind of everyone. Commodity prices are staying high, and this increases the food insecurity risk. So now, um, focusing back on Asia, bracing for tough time in 2023. I'm sorry, I'm bringing the not so good news. So the regional summary for Asia in 2023 is that it's um, from the export boom that we've seen post-pandemic, we're gonna see quite a big drop next year. And most countries in Asia will see a slowing GDP growth in 2023 compared to this year. But there are, there are three exceptions, um, China and Hong Kong, and that's because this year um, China will grow below 4%, like basically about 3%. But next year, with some relaxation of COVID um, restrictions, we expect some rebound in private consumption and, and, and other things. And Hong Kong will just follow China um, you know, lead. But another country that will see a faster growth um, compared to this year is Thailand. And this is basically uh, due to the fact that Thailand is a 
country that emerged a little bit more slowly from the COVID pandemic and the tourism sector is just starting to open up. So we see this story continuing next year. But even then, um, the, the overall picture of Asia is that of a slower growth. It's still one of the highest performing um, area compared to the rest of the world, other regions. Um, con consumer inflation will also stay high um, about 3.6%, but this is slowing from the above 4% this year. This is an average Asia. And price will be, um, the, the inflation problem will vary from country to country. Um, the countries that have deeper fiscal pocket that can actually subsidize um, price of oil and utilities will actually keep the inflation down um, superficially, or artificially rather. Um, so that is, um, you know, what, what we expect will continue in 2023. The government will dig into their pocket and, you know, borrow more money in order to help the households and business cope. Yeah, so uh, there's no running away from the fact that the US and the EU, which is going to see a very tough time next year, um, having an impact on Asia because the US accounts for about 15% of Asia trade and EU another 10 to 11%. Um, I, I, I don't think I can talk about Asia without talking about China. So this is our view on China. Um, even though we've been quite negative on China, but we think that the growth story in China is slow, but it's not over. They, they are actually recalibrating. And um, as all of you know, the rhetoric from the Chinese leadership is that they're um, going to look at common prosperity. And that's one of the reasons that the... Um, the technology sector as, and the property sector have been kind of targeted. And um, yeah, it, so it, it happened in a year that uh, was unfortunate because there was the war in Ukraine and so on and so forth. So the, so the downturn in the economy has been worse than they have expected. So China will have to figure out um, how they're going to um, keep growth going and at the same time, um, stay true to um, the common prosperity pledge. And that, that, that is more um, challenges into their old model, which is the manufacturing hub for the world. Well, that is now changing because number one, the US is trying to cut them off from the, from the chip supply chain. And then secondly, I think the experience from zero, from zero COVID policy in China has made a lot of companies now more uh, hesitant to expand their presence in China because of operational risk. So we've actually seen more investment or relocation of um, activities from China to ASEAN. And then China also has to think about their security concern. And now they have to diversify their source of key um, imports like energy, food, and so on and so forth. So, okay, another big question that I have to answer today is uh, when and how will the zero COVID end? So, um, I'm stating the obvious, the, the protest that we saw erupt in China is definitely pushing them to open up faster. Initially, my China team, my colleagues, put uh, three scenarios um, inertia, which is what we have seen in 2022, or chaotic end, you know, there's a, a very bad outbreak that cannot be suppressed, and agile exit. So now, I think we can say that the probability for inertia is actually lower. It will be either chaotic end or agile exit. So the, the good scenario will be agile exit. But chaotic end is not necessarily bad. Um, they will have, it will be a V-shape. They will have one very bad um, quarter. But after that, um, if the experience of other countries such as India at one point show, they, you know, the herd community, I mean, the herd immunity will, 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 will help, and then they will, they will emerge stronger. So it's actually either the last two scenarios is better than inertia in terms of GDP growth for China. So what about India? Where do we see India? We actually see India GDP growth 
and this is a very, our very long-term forecast into 2050, we see India GDP growth surpassing China all the way between now and 2050. So that's the good news, but the, that is still not enough for India to catch up with the size um, of China's economy. So in, in 2050, you can see that China will still be three times the size of India. But both economies combined will be a very strong locomotive for Asian growth. North Asia, um, in, this, in this case, um, Japan and South Korea, we have um, a rather cautious outlook for 2023 and over the next few years. And that's basically because they're, they're manufacturers, they have to contend with high commodity prices and um, you know, subdued global demand. And also they um, have to uh, worry about the fight, the US-China rivalry, which actually affects their business. So not, not a very uh, strong growth outlook for um, Japan and South Korea for the next two years. What about ASEAN? Okay, ASEAN is a little bit of a happier story. We, we see growth um, continuing um, into next year, more or less uninterrupted, but at a, at, a, at a slow, moderated pace compared to this year. So the momentum on slow growth in China will still weigh on, on ASEAN um, in terms of trade demand, but at the same time, the investment re re relocation from China into ASEAN will be positive for ASEAN's medium-term outlook as well. So um, in ASEAN, we also are mindful that some countries may see um, the negative impact of the high interest rates in the US and that uh, lead to capital outflows and and, and currency weakness, but uh, so far it has been under control and we think that uh, this will hold in 2023. So um, the last slide of the Asian section is which countries in Asia will be more vulnerable if interest rates keep on going higher and, and stay high longer. So in this case, we, uh, we look at the level of indebtedness of, of each economy. So in, in the developed Asia, um, the countries that are a little bit more exposed is Australia and South Korea. And in, in our part of the world, in emerging Asia, um, the, the two countries that are more exposed to high interest rates are those with the high um, indebtedness in the household sectors, and that's um, Malaysia and Thailand. So, Oh, this is the last slide. Um, looking between now and 2050, which Asian economies will emerge and join the G20 club? Um, Indonesia is already there, but in the year 2020, you can see that many Asian economies will be moving up in, in rank. Um, China, India is already up there. Indonesia and Japan is also among the top 10. South Korea as well. Um, but, you know, we have a newcomer. We think that Vietnam will, will join the, the G20 club by the year 2050. And China itself will, ex will, will exceed the U.S. in terms of economic size sometime between 2030 and 2035. So, okay, my last part, what are... Uh, what is our view on Asia housing markets? And, and I'm, I'm stressing housing, I'm not talking about um, commercial. So the view is correction, no crash in 2023. Um, the reason is because when we look in the past um, cycles, we find that um, Asian housing markets were surprisingly resilient during the pandemic years. And this is because it's supported by two things. Number one, interest rates were low. Number two, there were a lot of um, support or, or you know, the banking sector supports from the government that actually support, help to um, alleviate the, the debt servicing burden from, from the borrowers. So that really helped. But now this is being taken away. Interest rates are rising and all those um, debt um, forgiveness or, or debt holiday is, is taken back. 
So actually now we are, we are in, a, in, a, in a more difficult um, situation. But we do not think that the correction will be like in the past that we see a big boom bust, a big crash. And the reason is because a lot of Asian um, governments or authorities have been very proactive in trying to smooth the cycle. So um, there was no um, you know, big bubbles in some of the economies. Like in, in Hong Kong, we, we actually see a correction already, and it's, it's relatively larger than those. Uh, than, than other markets that you know, the price co corrected more than 10% already. And that's because of very high interest rates and the you know, Hong Kong cycle tend to be a little bit more, more magnified. Um, now the other two economies that we see that uh, is looking frothy and probably will see a higher correction risk is um, Taiwan and South Korea. The, the price um, increase in 21 and 22 was very strong, and, and you know, we, we, we think that it cannot continue to be like that indefinitely. But in the, the good news for ASEAN is that it's been the more stable um, markets, so we don't see much of uh, correction risks. But the upside will be kind of constrained because of the high interest rates prevailing, and also with GDP growth slowing, uh, income growth is not going to be um, very high. So the affordability is probably going to be under pressure. But in the long term, um, we feel that there are some factors that will support the housing markets in Asia. Now on China, where do we see the property market going? Um, here again, the good news is that the worst, we, we probably have seen the worst but at the same time, the recovery will not come as fast, as smooth, or as swift. In China, already the macro backdrop is not, is not um, very conducive. And there's a lot of um, problems with the developers that um, China will have to um, help them. Like, you know, China is very good at cleaning up their banking sector. We think that they may apply a similar approach in cleaning up the property sector. So that may lead to a paradigm shift. Um, you know, the days of seeing very big, large, influential um, private companies are probably not going to be repeated, and we may see more of, um, you know, state-directed kind of um, companies um, I think that is yet to be worked out, but that's our guess of where, where it's going. So when will things get better? Things will get better, but very slowly and very frustrating. Um, and when they reach the equilibrium again in 2023 or 2024, that equilibrium price will be lower than the, the, the pre-correction. So that's where we see China going. Okay, last, last slide. But despite all that, we are still quite positive that if you're looking beyond the difficult year next year, um, you know, we have the urbanization trend in Asia that will drive the property sector in, in both for commercial use and in, um, in residential use. We, we think that there will be some change in terms of the industrialization um, um, policy or, or you know, initiative. So things will look a little bit different now with, with ESG. So the new, like the reinventing the adaptive theme that you're talking about is going to apply with the new urban planning, with, uh, you know, the increased urbanization. They will, they will you know, the, the theme build back better will, um, will prevail. And we think that the policies are going to see more decentralization of city centers. Um, already in Singapore, you, know, they, we, you can see that the risk of having everything concentrated in one area is, is not good if there's another pandemic or whatever risk that, that pop up. So that, that theme of you know, being supportive to being um, sustainable, being um, decentralized, and digitalization, that's going to be the theme of urban planning for Asia in the next many, many years. That's where I will end. 
And if you have any questions, just grab me. We can talk about it later. Thank you very much. Thank you.